got your name on it. Oh, where is Jason? That's a good question. All right. Jason's got uh, yeah, issues right now that probably more pressing. He's doing fine. He's fine. He's fine. <laughs> I love him. Yeah. He speaks out of turn. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll get started here. We're uh, really fortunate to have our guest artist with us. And this is really kind of an open forum. We actually got caught up in a conversation backstage there and then realized what time it was and thought, hey, this might, maybe this would be a good thing to even talk about out here. But maybe um, to start, why don't we just kind of uh, go down the line and have everybody introduce themselves and, uh, and share maybe just a little bit about their background and then we can uh, open it up and kind of see where this leads. Um, I'm, I'm Braun, I probably know most of you, but teach base here at Utah State and have been here for uh, about four years now. Uh, I'm Corey Christiansen, and I, again, I teach like Braun here. I've been on sabbatical all year though, so I um, haven't seen most of you for, a, oh, in person for exactly 12 months. Well, 11 months and three weeks, I guess so. Anyway, it's good to see everybody. My name is Carl Allen, and I play drums. My name is Ben Williams. I uh, play bass, and um, yeah, I'm uh, originally from Washington, D.C. Uh, lived in New York up until yesterday, <laughs> and I'm <laughs> moving to Los Angeles, California. Hi, I'm Anna Vidovich, uh, classical guitar. I'm so glad to be here. Um, had a wonderful time teaching this morning. Had some really good students. So yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having me. This might be the first time the panel has outnumbered the audience. <laughs> and and you know, with all our events, obviously due to COVID, we're streaming this. So I, I know that the ten thousand plus people out there watching on the stream, you know. I wish we had a way for you guys to chime in with your questions, but we'll have to depend on our in-person crowd here. Who would like to kick us off? Yeah, well, um, hmm, where do I begin? So I was with him for eight years. I started with him when I was a senior in college. And um, it was one of the best experiences of my life, you know, musically, personally. And, and being with him, um, you know, I was really young, but it was kind of the beginning of me starting to understand how important community is. Uh, for example, uh, there were musicians that I, you know, I was living in New Jersey at the time, and there were musicians that I met. And of course, to having just moved out there, you don't really have a concept that you're just one of many. So I'm thinking, you know, I just moved to town, and you know, I go and meet so and so, and I'm, you know, and give them my number, and of course, they never call. And I, that happened a lot, right? And then right after I started playing with Freddie, some of those same people, I would see them and they say, hey man, aren't you playing with Freddie? And I'm like, yeah. So yeah, give me your number. Mm -hmm. I gave it to you before, but okay. And I, I didn't know how to take that and I would be hurt, you know, and probably pissed a little bit, you know, just my ego. So, and I remember saying it to Freddie, I said, Freddie, man, so and so, I told him what happened. He said, well, man, you, you were just one of a million drummers in New York before. He said, but now that you're playing with me, you know, you're now gonna be accepted into this community. And I still just had no idea what he was talking about. But it was kind of that conversation about paying dues and, and all of that, so. But I just, I learned a lot about a lot of stuff with him. You know, I, I think, um, you know, sometimes we as musicians, or especially young musicians trying to come up one of the things that we all tend to do is want to jump on the bandwagon about opinions that we have based on what we've heard about people. And um, 
you know, I, I used to always say I think he was one of the most misunderstood people because um, the reality with Freddie, he had a very big heart and uh, as great of a trumpet player as he was, he was very insecure. And so, you know, quite often people who are insecure, they kind of do things that may appear to be whatever, they lash out at people, whatever, but sometimes it's just masking their insecurities, you know. I'll give you an example. Last time I saw him alive, I was at his house in LA for about five hours. And, uh, and he said to me, which just still blows me away to this day, he says, um, you know, Carl, uh, uh, I've played with a lot of people and I've done a lot of things and gotten Grammys and all of that, and I thought that meant something to me, but, you know, the thing that meant the most to me in terms of all of my awards, then he asked his wife to bring his, his NEA award, National Endowment of the Arts. And he looked at that and he just started to cry. And he said, man, I said, man, help, what's wrong? He said, man, he said, this award means more to me than any other award because, in his words, he said, the cats wanted me to have it. You know, the Grammys, that's sometimes, well, people have different opinions about that. But I, he said, but until I got this award, he says, I always thought people thought my playing was corny. Now, I don't know anybody in the world who would say Freddie Hubbard's playing was corny. And I just looked at him. I said, man, are you serious? He said, man, I'm, yeah. He said, well, when I got this, it made me feel like people appreciated what I was trying to do. That was heavy, you know. But it was through playing with him that I got a chance to develop relationships with some, a lot of my drum heroes like Art, Blakey and Elvin and Billy Higgins and so many others, you know. And again, it was because of him, you know, so. That sense of community, relationships, and resources is a very, very important thing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. I, uh, yeah, we, uh, I don't know why, sometimes we do, uh, there's a tendency to forget about the quality of the sound, which makes every player very unique, you know, because you, when, when you hear, you know, I don't know, Williams, Bream, they all have their own uh, specific sound. So, um, so I encourage students, I didn't talk so much about this today because we didn't have time, but I do encourage them to work on their sound, something that's gonna make them unique. It's a long, long, long process. It, it is not something that's going to happen, you know, in, in a day or two. You have to live with the guitar. You have to breathe the guitar. You have to, you know, you have to find. You have to experiment. You have to try a lot of different types of nails, different positions. Uh, even, even how you strike this, this, you know, the string is is important. How much pressure you use, all those things will make a difference. Um, but. Um, how do you, for example, if you structure, if you're working on a new piece and how you structure, there's, you know, there's several, there's several stages. I think um, it's important to take it very, very slow, all the stages, you know, don't rush, don't play the piece through if you're not ready. Um, you know, the first step is to learn the notes, to read the notes, write down the fingerings, work on the left hand, work on the right hand, uh, then you put it all together. Uh, then the next, when you feel comfortable playing the piece through from the beginning to the end, then you work on dynamics, uh, on the sound, you know, what kind of sound you want to portray with this specific piece, what kind of character the piece has. Um, and usually the last step is memorization. You know, that's the last. And that takes the longest because memory is very tricky. So you have to, you have to work on it very diligent, diligently because, um, you know, when you play on stage and we perform for people. Nerves are, it's very tough because nerves will do a lot of things for, you know, <laughs> for your mind. So your memory has to be very, very secure in order to go on stage and play it. So 
I don't know. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do, I do. Um, I still take time, you know, to work on, on, on specific sounds. For me, it's more about, um, you know, wh wh what do I want to say with this certain piece? Like, how, how do I want it to sound? Wh what do I want to, what do I want to portray? What is behind this piece? You know, what, what feelings evoke in, in me? And then I adjust the sound um, to, to that, you know, so, um, but, you know, at this point, it's just, um, I use my ear, you know, I record myself, I, I, I listen to it, because it sounds completely different when you, when you listen to the recording. You know, when, when you're behind the guitar, it doesn't sound the same. So when you listen to the recording, it's like, wow, <laughs> is this what I do? You know, it, it just sounds completely, so it's, it's important to, to listen to yourself. And, and uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I still, you know, when I practice my scales, I still, work on the sound, you know, and, and um, the, the toughest thing for me is like the, the, you know, the sustain and the evenness of the sound. It's very, it's very tough to achieve that on guitar, you know, it's uh, because it's, um, you know, if you strike the string with a little more pressure, it's going to sound completely different. So you have to, you have to con control that, you know, in a way. Well, I don't do that anymore. I used to, many years ago when I was in college, I used to do about eight a day. But um, just to put it in the context, um, this was a couple of months before you were born. This was like 1979, right? I put it in the context. <laughs> I put it in the context because I think one of the things that keeps people from practicing now is because there are so many distractions. In 79, there were no cell phones. There was no cable TV. There was no internet. So you really didn't have much else to do. And this is in Green Bay, Wisconsin, so there's nothing to do, really. But, um, but one of the reasons that I did that is because I was motivated by fear. I didn't want to sound bad. And I was a jazz guy but, but, as a classical percussion major. I was a classical percussion major. So, you know, the eight hours, a lot of it was spent on mallet instruments and timpani and multiple percussion and stuff. But I am, I still do believe in the importance of consistent practice. And one of the things that I did not understand at that time is how to practice. You know, there's a, a philosophy or a concept of one of my mentors shared with me many years ago, which is about measurable progress in reasonable time. And the whole idea of that is that you want to be able to look back at a spe specific amount of time and you should be able to measure your progress. For instance, when the school year is over, you should be able to say, wow, here's some things that I can do now that I couldn't do at the beginning of the year. And if you're not able to do that, whether it's music or other things, then sometimes you have to go back and start to reevaluate how you're going about doing what it is you're doing. Right? Um, for instance, when, when this pandemic or reset first started. I said, you know, I don't know how long it's gonna last, none of us do, but I told myself that when it's over, I wanna be better than when it began. So it allowed me to go back and doing all of the stuff that we say we never have time to do because we're busy, right? Like I had time to go back and start practicing again. I had to learn how to practice all over again. And that sounds strange, but if you, you know, if you have a life where you've been so wonderfully blessed to be working all the time, usually when you're practicing, you're practicing something for a gig. You're preparing for a record date. Yeah. But now all of that's done, you got nothing. You got a clean slate. So it's like, what do you practice? Going back to the basics, to the fundamentals. You know, so, but um, I do believe, I do believe in and I don't know what the right number is. I mean, there are some people who will say, hey, you gotta be X number of hours a day. I think everybody's different. I do believe though, if this is what you wanna do for a living and you're practicing two or three hours a week, 
If you can't do any more than that, you might want to consider something different. Because I, I just don't see how you can really get to that next level doing that. That's just my opinion. You can, you can, always, play, you can always play music. Yeah. Right? But I concur completely. You know, if you, you know, struggle with being in love with practicing during your formative years, it's going to be pretty tough yeah. to, to get to the level where that can be what you do, um, you know, as a living. Um, it's kind of interesting because when the pandemic hit, you and I talked quite, we've talked every couple weeks, you know, probably to see what each other was up to. And, uh, and I kind of, um, <clears throat> you know, I agree with Carl, like this, this time that we've had has given us time to do some things that, uh, you know, that um, uh, we didn't have time before, you know, for a lot of us that were very busy playing and different projects. But I, I tell you one experience that happened to me. I had just um, posted a thing on on my social media, and I'd said, "Man, you know, it was about three months into it." And I was like, "I am really missing playing music with with other people," you know. And um, Bruce Foreman, you know Bruce. <laughs> Bruce called me up, and he chewed me out. Like, I mean, he gave me the business, and, and Bruce is one of my dear, dear friends, but he gave me the business. He's like, listen, man, he's like, you are a creative. It has nothing to do with, like, you know, um, only playing with other people. You've got an opportunity here to really carve some stuff out and, and, to, and, to, and to find yourself. And he's like, I don't want to, you know, hear about you moping around. and be, Like, he gave me, like, this, like, almost like big brother slash you know, fatherly kind of kind of lecture, and I got off the phone, and I was like, geez, all I said was, you know, I like miss playing music with my friends, and, but it was kind of cool, you know, I think it's good that you, you know, kind of going back to what Carl was saying, too, having some community, like where you got some people that like know you well enough to be like, okay, this person needs a little shot in the arm, and that's what I needed to hear was like, yeah, look, everybody misses playing with, with, you know, music with other people, but don't, don't focus on the bad aspect of this, F fix on the good. And he said this, almost the exact same thing Carl said. He's, I said, man, we've all been project driven. You know, we have a project and we're getting ready for a project. Well, you don't have a project now. So what do you want to work on that is just you, yours? Like it's not a gig for somebody else. It's like, what do you want to work on? Man, it was such a great phone call. You know, and frankly, it was more than a phone. I mean, it was a lecture, you know, I got a lecture. Um, from my pal Bruce, and um, so I did. You know, I took his I took his advice, and I thought, okay, well, what what you know, what do we work on now that's not necessarily project driven? Anyway, I kind of but you know, faded it's, it's there. interesting. It was, you know, because I, I was just thinking about you, you brought up Freddie. I had a moment where um, I I almost got fired. So. Um, and I'll, I'll make this really brief because I got a question for Ben. Uh, after being in the band for about, I don't know, a year or so, Freddie told me, he says, um, Carl, you need to learn how to play with more intensity. I said, okay, I will play louder. <laughs> and so he said, after a while, he said, man, I didn't ask you to play louder. I said, I need you to play with more intensity. So he said it again. And then, of course, I made the fatal mistake of saying, what do I do? And he just looked at me. He says, um, uh, what instrument do you play? I said, I play drums. He said, what do I play? I said, you play trumpet. He says, um, yeah. If I have to tell you what to do, I'll, I'll, I'll find somebody else. <laughs> he said, what would you like to do? I said, I'll figure it out. <laughs> so, so he would give me three drummers at a time. And, you know, he, you know, a couple of months later, the first three drummers he gave me was Elvin, Max, and Connie Kay. I'm still thinking volume, but then when he said Connie Kay, it kind of messed me up. Okay, so then a couple of months later, he would give me three, three more drums. This went on for 11 months. So finally, out of my frustration, I said, man, Freddie, just what, you know? So, of course, he chewed me out. And then about a month later, we're on the road, he calls me to his room. He said, have a seat. I sat down, I said, yeah. He said, man, you know why I was going to fire you about a year ago? 
And I just started shaking because I didn't know he was going to fire me. I'm like, no, why? He said, man, because I thought you were looking for a shortcut. He said, man, ain't no shortcuts in this music, man. He said, now, I could have told you the first night what to do, and you wouldn't have learned anything. Yeah, you would have played with more intensity for me. He said, but think about these 11 months. Think about all the people you've played in these 11 months. And he named, you know, Chick and, you know, uh, Betty Carter and Johnny Griffin, all these people. He said, now, because you went through the journey, you know how to play with intensity for each one of them. Because what I need for intensity is not going to be the same as what somebody else needs. It's one of the greatest lessons I ever learned. Because he said, man, there are no shortcuts. I was like, wow. That was a great, that was a great lesson. So my question for Ben, Ben is the baby in, on the stage, right? So you always got to embarrass him a little bit. Well, actually, I'm the baby, but anyway. <laughs> no, but seriously, this is a question. This is something that I've, I've, I've been thinking about um, recently. Okay, so, so Ben, you, you know, you, you, you've played with some of the older guys. You've played with, you know, guys of different kind of genres from Sadao Watanabe to Pat Metheny and a bunch of other. And, of course, now you are part of the staple of your generation. What do you see has changed? in the past 10 years, musically, personally, and, and anything else? Um, what, what, I mean, are you talking about specifically jazz or just, just overall just in music? Just overall. Because um, you, you, you can speak generationally, mm -hmm. probably in a way to these, to a lot of them that, that I know I probably couldn't. Because you, you're closer in age to them. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I was uh, thinking about something when you, um, you know, you were talking about, uh, you know, practicing when you were younger and that, you know, how there was, you said there was nothing else to do. There was no, there were no phones and, you know, no cable TV and, you know, no distractions. And I was thinking about um, just how, I think how important, you know, not just saying this because I'm part of it, but just how uh, important my generation is to, to not just music, but the world really, you know, we've kind of been like the link between this, uh, you know, pre-digital and pre-social media world and, you know, what we're living in now. And, um, you know, so I'm like at the age where I, I do remember, you know, before the internet and, you know, having to go to the library and record stores and, you know, um, experiencing like this kind of physical world and, um, that's kind of how I, at least in the, my early formative years, that's how I learned, um, you know, it was with going to the, so, you know, going to Tower Records and buying CDs and um, just going out and getting books and, you know, not having the, the kind of access to information that we do now. And, um, you know, just kind of having that, you know, what you were probably, you know, familiar with just, um, you know, when you listen to a record, you just listen to it over and over and over again. And the way you absorb things was, you know, I think it was more effective because you you probably spent more time with maybe fewer things than, um, as I see like with a lot of people of my generation, you know, we have access to um, literally everything all the time. And um, I think it's, the, the struggle for our generation is fine, trying to find, uh, trying to find out what's important, you know, what, uh, you know, what do we, wh when you have everything at your disposal, um, it's hard to determine importance, wow. yeah. you know, um, so I think it's really, I think it kind of ties to what you, you know, what you're talking about with Freddie, which is uh, seeking mentorship, because you know, a lot of times that, you know, that's where you can f get help and finding those answers and um, having somebody tell you, like, listen to these records, listen to this, you know, this artist and this drummer and, you know, whatever instrument you play. So you can have some direction um, because I think without that, it's really, really easy to just get, you know, just kind of lost and lost in the sauce of every, everything. You know, we just, um, uh, it's, 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 it's daunting. I think, um, you know, we, uh, 
I, I think that's probably the major challenge of, uh, of our generation. Um, as far as, you know, uh, musicians and, and, you know, st students especially. Um, but I think on the, on the, the other side of that is the, that access to information and really like the, the connectivity we have with the whole world has kind of changed the music scope in, in a certain way where I feel like it's very much, it's very wide open. I think, you know, a lot of people are being very much influenced by um, um, just the world, you know, artists from all over the world and different genres. And I feel like these kind of, these sort of lines of um, style and genre are very much being blurred in, in, in the music. And I think it's really cool. I, I, um, I think it's creating some really interesting music and, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see, you know, uh, what becomes of it. But, uh, you know, I think there's definitely a, uh, um, a positive to that as well. You know, it just reminds me of Art Blakey used to always say that he always kept younger musicians in the band because it helped keep him fresh. And, uh, and now that I'm, I'm getting older, well, we're all getting older, but I really, really understand that because I always say I don't want to be that guy, that, you know, older guy that's just kind of lost. And so many musicians of my generation get stuck. You know, it's like, I mean, I have conversations with friends of mine who'll say, oh, man, when I was their age, well, but you're not their age. You know what I mean? So we, we it, it, you know, you see it, you know, and uh, and so we we tend to project that, and and it makes it difficult to sometimes to musically communicate with musicians of different genres. And I'll, I'll tell you, not to put them on the spot, but it's these kinds of moments that make me particularly proud of Ben because you know, of course, I've known him for a while, and and one of his bass teachers and mentors is one of my closest friends, Rodney Whitaker. And then, of course, he came to Juilliard when I was there. But I remember talking to Ron Carter about him. And Ron says, oh, yeah, man, I've known him since he was like 12, you know? <laughs> so, but to see that, of course, I didn't know him when he was 12. But I'm saying, to, to think about that, that process and to see how he's taken advantage of his talent and his gifts and the relationships and those resources to be doing what he's doing now, it's just the kind of thing that for someone like myself, this is what we hope for. This is what you want, you know, so. Well done, young man, well done. <laughs> okay, I'll just she has a question right here. Huh? Are you looking around? <laughs> Are we just calling? No, we calling you out. Yeah. Uh, you just raised your hand, so that's you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you knew before I raised my hand. Uh, this is for Anna. Um, Sure. Yeah. Well, this year was, uh, as Carl said, I think um, a good, you know, good test for all <laughs> all of us musicians uh, to keep going and and to um, to focus on certain things that we, we usually don't have time to focus. You know. So I kind of went back to the, to some of the basics. You know that we always have to remember. Uh, and keep reminding ourselves, but um, okay, so f what I do every day, the, the amount of hours, it doesn't really matter, you know, I could practice um, five hours, 10 hours, two hours, it just, it ju I just practice until I do everything that I wanna do that day. So, you know, I would, I always suggest students to just practice, it, you know, it's more about how effectively you practice than the amount of the hours, that, that, that doesn't matter. You could practice an hour, but practice it really, really well. Um, I always start with scales, you know, I do like 20 minutes of scales, I play them very, very slow, I make sure that I warm up my hands, which is very important, because you don't wanna play with cold hands. Um, you know, your hands have to be stretched and just feel good. And then I go into, into my pieces. Uh, sometimes I'll do some of the etudes, like Lobos etudes, just to, again, warm up my hands. 
but I do, I have a plan for a day, so if, let's say if I'm working on a new piece, um, and you know, I'm working on some technical things, um, I'll do like an hour of that, you know, just work on technique, work on fingerings, make sure that I write everything down in the score, um, and then, you know, then I'll go into working on like mu musical part of the piece, you know, I just, uh, I'll, you know, have an idea, a clear idea of what I want to do with a certain piece. Um, so it's all about like a lot of planning and what you want to do that certain day. Um, I, I never just, you know, play for the sake of playing. The, the only time when <laughs> where, where I actually get to play something through is on stage, you know, by the time I get to, th to the stage, uh, everything has to be prepared. So when I'm at home, when I'm practicing, it's just work, work, work. You know, just you, you know, just you, you just work. You focus on certain things and and uh, until you get them done. So it's um, you know. But number one is just have a plan for for that day. Have a plan of what you want to do and what you want to accomplish. So um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> okay, sure. Guys, is there any jazz etiquette that you don't learn in school? I mean, we almost could do a whole master class on that, probably, right? Um, I'll say this, that um, one thing that happens in school, even in our jam sessions here, is that um, the horn players always get to pick the tunes as they come on the stage. You notice that, Carl? And I could bet I can count on one hand um, how many times there's been a collegiate horn player that has come onto the stage and asked the rhythm section what they would want to play. But that's one thing that I notice with professionals is that it becomes, uh, it's polite to ask what other people want to play. Now, in the same breath, I say I understand why some of that is. Sometimes it's like, hey, this, I don't have a lot of tunes, you know, to, to, uh, to walk on the stage and ask the rhythm section, because they might call a tune I don't know. But you know what? That's maybe the best lesson you could get, is to ask somebody what tune they want to play, and then they tell you, and you don't know it. And you have to say, what? I don't know that tune. Then you go home and you learn that, you know, you learn that tune. <laughs> what, what instrument do you play? Do you, do you play? Okay. Oh. Well, then you're, you're one of us. You feel our pain. <laughs> yeah. But it's the same, it kind of could be the same, same thing, though. Um, you know, one, one thing that I, I have noticed um, since moving back to Utah is that um, there's maybe a lack, of, a lack of that sometimes. You know, people, people not being so worried about their uh, agenda and worried about, like, the band's agenda, I guess. Um, I'm probably not answering this very articulately because it's... Um, it's, it's just some things I've been thinking about recently with, with younger, younger players. I mean, the main thing is to, to you know, give respect to, to the band, and hopefully you are learning that in school. I don't know, it's kind of a difficult question because it's hard to say what you, what you are learning and what you are. Hopefully, you know, like being here at this school, you have, um, I know, uh, you know, a faculty that, uh, that respect each other, and hopefully that's one of the things you're learning, you know, from, from us. I know, I'm going to kind of jump ship in. It looked like maybe you have something to, to say about this. Um, I mean, there's a few things, but um, if, I, if there's one sort of overarching thing, I would say is just be considerate. You know, I think um, you kind of lose perspective. You know, it's, it's kind of easy to lose perspective in school as a student. You're kind of in a, this little bubble of just people that all do the same thing that you do. Um, but you know, you realize that you you are in a a bubble when you. But you're you're developing, you're practicing something that's uh, that's going to involve mostly people that don't do what you do, and don't really understand what you do, and don't really care to understand what you do. And um, 
you gotta always remember that. So, you know, as soon as you step out into the real world, there's uh, you, ha you have to learn how to communicate. You know, you're, you have to um, learn how to play in a way that communicates. And so that people, it's, you know, it's understood by people that don't play music, that don't know anything about music. Um, whatever that means to you. Um, but I think that's, that's probably the biggest lesson I think most students probably get when they, they leave school is like, oh yeah, we gotta play for people that are paying money to come see us. And that's, you know, it's, it, it sounds like a little bit sterile to say, but it's reality. Um, and it's really important. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of things with, um, about musicianship that actually um, have a lot to do with uh, how you communicate to an audience, how you communicate to other musicians on a stage. Um, yeah, just be considerate. I think, you know, another thing that came to mind, and, you know, I, this is, you know, not a genre specific thing, of course, but it's, I think after you get out of school, you start to learn what you're actually willing to give and the sacrifice for the music. Do you think that's fair to say, Carl? Because so I remember when I was in school, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm so busy. And I'm like, I'm giving so much to the music. And then you become a professional and you start going out on the road. And like last night at dinner, you know, uh, with Nate and Austin and Anna, we were, we were just, you know, talking about like crazy gig stories, you know, and just like, like traveling. And you start thinking about like, oh my gosh, how much do you give, you know, for, for the music? And I don't think we can teach you that in in school is like what is your you know what is your level of what you're willing to sacrifice and what you're willing to do to to have the the, the honor to play music you know for uh, for yourself but also for for other people um, that's that's one thing the professional world maybe has taught me like what I was it's really illuminated like what I I know what I was what I have been willing to give yeah you, you know just to kind of add to, to both of those really great answers. You know, again, going back to being considerate, being respectful, and understanding the importance of, and I know this may sound a bit old school, learning how to stay in your lane. You know, as musicians, we all want to be accepted. That's kind of part of what drives us, right? When somebody calls us, someone asks for us to do a gig, we feel accepted. One of the things that I've noticed that you don't really sometimes get in school because of the sense of community that happens in that environment, sometimes we'll go out amongst other people's gigs and we just insert ourselves like we're part of that scene, a part of that family, you know? And, and I'm a bit hypersensitive to that kind of thing. I mean, for example, if I go to the Village Vanguard, if I go to see Ben play, and he's playing with some other people, right? I played the Vanguard a thousand times. But while I'm not in the band that night, if I want to say hello to Ben or somebody in the band, I wait till they come off the bandstand. Because that's sacred space for them. So you learn to respect that space, right? It's like, you know, I think about the flip side of those things that annoy me. I'm in the dressing room, we're trying to chill, you're on a break, just the musicians chilling. Then here comes somebody just barging in the dressing room. Hey, what's going on? They're like, man, who are you? <laughs> or even if you know who they are, you're like, can you just give us some space? You know, or we want to be accepted, so we hear other people talking, we just learn to jump in the conversation. And the older musicians will have a way, when I was coming up, to kind of look at you like, no, you're not in this conversation. And of course, if you don't understand what that's about, it's easy to become defensive, like, oh, that's jive, who you think you are, you know? But one of the great lessons that I learned from playing with people like Benny Golson and others is that you always have to understand that everybody's accountable to somebody. And there's always another level that you may not understand. For example, um, you learn to take your cues from the band leader, right? So I don't care if the band leader's younger than you or whatever, right? So if I'm playing with 
if I, let's say for instance, I like wearing jeans and t-shirt, right? But if the band leader's always going on stage with a, with a jacket and a suit or whatever, I realize I'm a side man, I'm representing them, right? I may have a problem with the drums, I may have a problem with the whatever, but they not, may not remember my name, they'll just say, oh, so-and-so's drummer was a drag, right? And then that can cost them a gig, that can cost them relationships. So, you know, when I say learn to stay in your lane, just understand that you're accountable. And not only are you accountable, but the people that who've hired you, you know, they're accountable for you. So if you come and you're not prepared, you're not dressed properly, you're late, or you, whatever the issues are, it makes them look bad. I always say, you don't want to be the one. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, I mean, I was, yeah. Um, as, as someone who's been on both sides of it, uh, as a band leader and as a you know, side band for a lot of folks, um, I feel like doing both is definitely maybe uh, more uh, respectful and both, you know, just having a better understanding of, um, you know, how important it is to not be that dude. Um, because, you know, you know, as a bass player, probably the most of the work you're going to have is as a side man playing with, you know, behind somebody, with someone else. Um, but, you know, band leaders deal with a whole lot, you know, um, like 10 times more than what you have to deal with uh, just showing up to play the gig. You know, they have to deal with agents and uh, promoters and, you know, money and all kind of stuff uh, before you even show up. So, you know, they have a lot to think about. They have a lot on their plate. You know, there's a lot of people that are involved into just making this one show happen. So, you know, when we say don't be that dude, you don't want to be that dude, don't, you know, add to the list of uh, worries that the band leader has. You know, your job is to make his, his life, easy, his or her life easier. So, um, you know, that's, there's a laundry list of things that you need to do, you know, when just showing up prepared, you know, on time, just being cool, you know, all of that. Well, the thing, the last thing you said about being cool, you know, there's a friend of mine that we all know, and I, we've worked together forever. His name is Christian McBride. And one of the things that I always notice about Christian, it doesn't matter how tired we all are, if we're on the road or whatever, whoever he deals with, he gives them just a level of respect. You know, even if they really did something drag, like a drag. Now, his road manager will be there, his manager stuff gives out. But I mean, you think about it, people come in and all kinds of people want to talk to him and whatever, he's giving everybody a certain level of respect. And, and so I've never seen him vibe anybody. You know, when you see him, I've known him for 30 years. You see him, so if I see him next week, my instincts is to shake his hand, right? I mean, we're not talking about COVID. And he, no, he's hugging you, right? And he makes everybody feel comfortable. And because of that, in addition to his unbelievable musicianship, everybody just loves him, right? I mean, and in the years that I've played with him all over the world, we're talking about actors and athletes and rock musicians and Mary Wells from the Supremes, Chaka Khan wanted to marry him, all kind of stuff. I mean, all of these people show up at the gig. When we play in New York, it's like every night there's like famous actors and, and you know, they texting each other during the day, you know, Rick Carlisle, foot basketball coach, you know, they're friends. But I just say that we have we all have a fragrance. That's the way I like to look at it. And sometimes you're gonna draw people into you, and sometimes you're gonna push them away from you. And as Ben said, you don't wanna be that dude, or that do that, or whatever it is, but you, you wanna, you don't wanna, you wanna attract people to you. I'm, I'm gonna throw this out there, because I, I share it with, with some of you, but some of you may have not heard me say this. I used to have four things, and now it's five. But I have five things, and I'm like, if you do these five things, it takes luck out of the equation, okay, for, for making it. Probably in any, in any business, but definitely in the music, you know, the music side of things. The first thing is, you have to be really good at what you do. Like, 
like the better you are, the more opportunities will come your way. I think that's that everybody would agree with that. The second thing is you got to be on time. And so I have this like slogan that is uh, early is on time, on time is late, and late is fired. All right, so be on time. The second thing is be a good hang, which is like falls under the be, be cool. And the fourth is wear the right threads. And number five, which I've added after this year, is be adaptable. You know, be able to change and be able to accommodate. So, I mean, you asked for something that you, you learn outside of school. I learned all that outside school, but I just told you that in school. So, I guess it was in school. I don't know. What do you think, Carl? You know, if I could just add something that along the lines of what everybody said and maybe to get to kind of the way you phrased the Parker question, or the question, Parker. I think one of the things that's kind of artificial about school sometimes is we put you in these groups and you're in that group for the whole year, like regardless of what happens. But once you get out of school, people have a choice. And so, you know, all of these things that have all been shared relate to whether or not you get that second gig you know, you might get a chance on the first gig, but how you handle all these things either leads to the second gig. And in school, you get a grade at the end of the semester. You know, outside, you don't get a grade. You just notice like, wow, it's Friday night and I'm at home, you know, watching Netflix again. And my friends are out playing. And that's kind of your feedback. So, you know, we don't want to get lulled into that sense of like, just because I'm in school, I get to play all the time. You know, once you get out, it's kind of based on how you, how you measure up on all these things that creates those opportunities. You know, a friend of mine used to say that main, obtaining is easy, maintaining is hard. The other, the last thing I'll say on this is, is um, develop relationships. Again, we're talking about communication with your peers, right? We don't have time to go into it now, I'm sure, but Ben, if you were to just to think about all of the people you played with that you went to school with, mm -hmm. right? And see, when you're in school with somebody, you're not thinking that. You're just thinking, oh, they're just here, and then later I'll be there, and then, you know, it's just the world is much smaller than we think it is, you know? Can I tell you something, story about that? So when I got out of school, one of the first jobs I got was hired to be the senior editor and the AR artist relations guy at Mel Bay Publications, which was the biggest uh, guitar publishing company in the world. It's actually where Anna, Anna and I met first, I think, was, was through her publications and some of the DVDs that uh, that company distributed. And um, so my first month is that job, and it was a great job because they let me tour six months out of the year. So I could be on the road for a week, and then I'd be in the office a week, and then on the road a week, and in the office a week. But the CEO of the company, uh, who was just so passionate about music, and especially guitar music, put me in charge of developing a lot of projects, like pedagogical materials that we were going to publish. And so he'd say, okay, look, in six months, I need a series that, you know, like accomplishes this. And then I had to sit down and think of a couple things, like, okay, well, what books would do this? What publications would do this? What video content would accomplish this? And then who do I want to do this material? And guess who I call first? All the cats I went to school with. It was like my pals. And it wasn't the people that showed up real late for class or didn't do their homework or didn't like participate in class or, or were difficult to, to get along with. It was quite the opposite. It was like, okay, who do I know was like always had it together? You know, and I'm, and I'm thinking like three or four people right now, I said, man, these guys were great. And I know that if I make that call, they're not gonna make me look bad. But those relationships started in school. And it was the people that got the work from me anyway, were the ones that really excelled um, when I was their, uh, you know, their peer, or their colleague as students. Um, 
what what instrument do you play? Guitar. Guitar. Okay. Um, well, I think building I would say building a you know a jazz vocabulary is you know you can kind of just look at it as the same the same way you would build a vocabulary with anything like learning a language. All right. So you know if you if you're learning you know if you're trying to learn French, you know first you just learn words. Um, you try to put the words together and make some phrases and, um, you know, you try to get to the point where you can have conversation. Um, and, you know, ultimately, the, the goal of vocabulary is to learn how to communicate. You know, if you're learning French, you're learning so you can talk to other people who speak French, right? So, um, you know, you just kind of look at it like that. So, um, in musical terms, I would say, um, you know, the vocabulary uh, is, you know, there's like building blocks to it, you know. Obviously you have to have, um, you have to learn your instrument, you know. You have to, the better you are at your instrument, you know, the more, the easier it'll, it'll be able, to, you'll be able to get to whatever vocabulary you want to, you want to develop. Um, but yeah, you know, listening to records, um, um, that's definitely the, best way to get to it um, you know playing with playing with people um, playing with you know whoever the best musicians are around you and um, uh, just trying to get just you have to just absorb the music you have to just immerse yourself in whatever it is you 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 want to learn you know um, and there's, there's there's so many ways to get to it now there's a, but I would say, you know, um, however you go about it, you know, make sure it's, it's, it's in a way that you, re you truly absorb the information that you're getting and that you just don't get like, you know, sort of like the surface, uh, the surface part of it. And, um, you know, uh, there, there's always, you have to always think about the context of, you know, what, what it is you're listening to, too. Um, when you're, um, you know, I think there's always a, a historical context to, to everything. So, you know, if you're listening to music of a certain period, um, you should also learn a little bit about what was happening, you know, maybe in that country or maybe in the world during that time too, and sort of start, start to dig into like why certain things sounded a certain way. And, you know, that's kind of the next level of it. But yeah, listening, do a lot of listening. You know, I, I would say, so I heard someone say something recently which I thought was pretty interesting, which kind of indirectly addresses your question, but you know, play what you would want to hear. But the, one of the things that, that I've been able to do during this reset time is go back to a lot of listening. And I like to say that, um, it's like this, you guys are college students. Pre-COVID, I'm sure you guys occasionally went to a party. If you, go, if you go to parties, you also realize that you're probably not invited to every party, right? To me, every song, metaphorically speaking, is like a party. And so what I mean by that is that you try to think about playing something that's appropriate for that. Okay, and my listening here, one of the records that I've been, had been checking out is um, Quincy Jones' Walking in Space, right? Killer Joe, Ray Brown, Grady Tate. There are not many people you'll find that love Elvin Jones as much as I do, but I don't think he was invited to that party. What do I mean? Conceptually, the way that Elvin plays and conceptually what that record is, I'm sure he would have sounded great, but I don't think it would perfectly fit it as much as greater. Do you know what I mean? So again, it goes back to you know listening, just knowing what to do at the appropriate time. That's where there's no shortcuts. You know, it's just so it was so wonderful for me to listen to you talk about listening and, and paying attention to the length of notes because sometimes 
even as you guys are sitting here listening, you probably say, oh, you got classical person, you got jazz people, and we put these walls up like they're these completely separate worlds. But this is just all music, right? You still gotta pay, and to hear you talk about practicing your scales, that's music, right? If I'm talking with a drummer and I say, play me a paradiddle, it's not a jazz paradiddle and a classical paradiddle, it's just a paradiddle, right? So I think we make things more complicated than they have to be, and I know that's probably going around the circle of your question, but. Maybe, maybe we could end with, uh, I would love to hear everyone here on the panel share, like if you could, and maybe there's a couple ways you could think about it, uh, either like some great advice that you got when you were younger from a mentor that, that really helped you, and, and I know we've kind of hit on some of those things already, um, or if you could go back and speak to like your younger self mm -hmm. and give your younger self some advice, wh what would you say? And that could be like at any stage in the, in the development. You wanna start on like me, with me and just go down? Sure. Well, I'm gonna answer both. I wish I could go back and tell myself things are gonna be okay. Like just keep practicing and do the work and things are gonna be all right. That would have been nice to have, you know, not, not been so stressed out um, and worried, you know, maybe like if things were gonna work out. Um, but the best advice, well, maybe not the best, but some great advice I got was um, from a really great friend of mine and I did a bunch of projects with him, a guitar player named Vic Juris. And uh, I had a record that came out and it uh, was my first record that got uh, reviewed in uh, Downbeat or Jazz Times, I can't remember. And it was kind of, it was a positive review, but there were a couple of things that that were a little bit negative in there that had to do with things that didn't even really matter, like the mix of the record or something like that, I can't remember. And I was kind of a little bit bummed out about it. And I was with Vic, we were on the road, and Vic said to me, and this was so great, he said, listen man, for the rest of your life, when you put music out, somebody is going to write about it. And he said, and when they write something bad, don't believe it. And when they write something good, don't believe it. Um, well, so the one question was about your younger self and the other one was what about what? Maybe advice that you got from a mentor mm. that was helpful. Well, well, okay, so one thing, when I mentioned to you all about understanding you being accountable, one thing I wish I had learned earlier, I used to get, and st it still bothers me, I just learned to deal with it a little bit better, so upset if I go places and the drums were just really sad. You know, if you got back line. And they were just really, really sad. And I just remember being in Europe somewhere with, with Benny Volson, and the drums were horrible. But not only were the drums horrible, I saw on another stage, or actually backstage, the drums that I wanted. But they had just decided that I couldn't play those drums for whatever reason. They're all rental drums, so it's not like they belong to somebody else, whatever. And I just went off, right? And Benny pulled me aside later, and he didn't tell me then. He waited a couple of days. He said, Carl, you know, I understand you were not happy with the drums. You gotta find a way to, pe to speak to people um, to make them want to give you what you wanted. He said, now, yeah, they probably would have gotten it for you because you're playing with me, and they said, oh, well, he's playing with Benny. And, but what you don't want to do is leave that situation in, this, in a way where they never want to see you again. And I was not thinking about that at all. I was just thinking about, I want the drums that I want, right? But that takes me back to some of great advice. Again, going back to just the drums. I was in Paris once with Freddie, and on the bill was Art Blakey and Billy Higgins. And this is, you know, early, mid-80s where the airline was just notorious for losing their stuff. And Art used to always take his own drums. And in France, they would go on strike for anything. So his drums didn't show. We all had to play the same drums. The bass drum must have been about 28 inches high. That you, you know, no spurs on it. And Rick's holding up the bass drum. The drums were horrible, right? So Art played, 
It was unbelievable. Billy Higgins played. It was magical. I played probably the worst things anyone has ever heard. So after the gig, I'm backstage and I'm throwing boxes and I'm kicking chairs and I'm just really upset. And Art comes to me, he puts his arms around me and says, what's wrong? I said, Art, my drum rider said four cymbal strands, 18 inch bass drum, blah, 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 blah. He's just looking at me. And so he said, let me ask you something. I said, yeah. Do you play the drums or do the drums play you? I said, yeah, but he said, if you could really play it, it wouldn't matter. And he just walked away laughing. If you could really play it. <laughs> <Hey. laughs> That's awesome. Like, okay. If you could really I, play it. I guess I can't play it. <laughs> you know, because if you think about it, he and Billy Higgins played the same kit. And that's when I realized, no, I'm still a boy. Those are grown men. Because they made it work. And there are, there are hundreds of thousands, if not more, examples of that. And the greatest example that I can use of that, listen to piano players. They play different instruments all the time, right? Herbie's going to sound like Herbie. It doesn't matter what piano you put him on, because it's his touch. So it took some maturity for me to understand that. Yeah, um, I don't know if I would. <laughs> I don't know if I would go back to my younger self and tell him anything. Um, I feel like that would throw off the the time continuum somehow and just cause a ripple and just ruin the future. Um, like in Back to the Future, like you know when Biff, like whatever, you know. Yeah. You know um, but. Um, Wow, I mean, I've gotten a lot of great advice. Um, always, this this always kind of sticks out in my head. I was doing this uh, this this workshop, and uh, it was in Russia, I think, at St. Petersburg, with uh, it was through the Monk Institute, uh, now the Hancock Institute, and um, it was uh, me and uh, Otis Brown was playing drums. Uh, Herbie was playing piano. Uh, I think Mike Mike Rodriguez and Walter Smith the third. And um, somebody asked Herbie a question about, um, I forget what the question was, but you know, he started talking about um, just kind of the meaning of music for him. And uh, I remember one of the things he said was, uh, he says, music, he said, music is not about music. And I, I didn't really understand what he meant when he first said it, but um, I think I, you know, as I get older, I, I understand. I start to understand more and more what he, what he actually means. Um, just kind of the, his perspective of, uh, of what he does is, um, you know, is much bigger than just like the thing, you know. It's, he's, uh, he's looking at music from a very hu um, humanist perspective. So it's like, I, you know, I have a feeling like he's, what he's trying to say is like, what you do is not who you are. So, yeah, that's the thing. Great, I just, I really learned a lot today. Uh, which I chuckled at what Corey said when he said, you would say something to yourself when you were younger, you said, it's gonna work out. Yeah. <laughs> it usually does, <laughs> I mean, um, that's what I was told several times. Don't worry, it's gonna work out. Don't take yourself too seriously. But that's that's a good advice too. And take it one day at a time. You know, it's a journey. Like it's it's something that takes many, many years. You know, you have to go through ups and downs, difficult times, good times. Um, and um, and realize that music is just music. I'm so glad that we're all sitting here. You know, it's it doesn't matter if it's classical, it, 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 jazz, blues, rock, pop, anything, it's all music. Surround yourself with as much music as you can. It's all beautiful. When I started listening to jazz and blues, I learned so much. You know, it was just, it was like, wow. It, it, I, I wish, you know, I wish I <laughs> could go back and, and, and learn how to play, you know, jazz and blues, but it's too late now. Anyway. But you no, know, it's a. Um, no, no, no. No, <laughs> no I need, think I think we it's. We need you. You need to come to us. <laughs> okay, I just, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's really, it really brings so much to because a class, as classical musicians, sometimes we're so we're too strict, 
you know, in, in our thinking, a little bit too constricted. So I think it's important to open up your ears and, and, and apply what you hear from other styles of music into what you do. You know, you can still apply these things and, you know, when you play classical music, I mean. So, um, yeah, and then just, um, you know, listen to your teachers. <laughs> That's important. But, you know, at the end, you have to create your own voice. You have to create your own, you know, your own persona, your own sound, and um, and uh, don't don't sound like anyone else. So sound like yourself. You know, learn to be yourself and learn to don't. You know, of course, you have to have idols and people you admire and people you listen to and you know musicians you love. And but at the end of the day, you still have to be you. So you know, and, and we talked about the the, the sound. You know, in classical in classical guitar, sound is very very important. You know. As I said before, you know, when you listen to a certain guitarist, you just know, okay, that's, you know, that's them. So that's a big part of what we do. Yeah. So, and, you know, and just have fun. <laughs> yeah. Can I make a suggestion? And I don't know if you guys are doing this or not. Because Ben touched on a little bit about listening. You know, um, I did something the other night, you know, and when I was, So we're sitting around, and, and one of the guys, David Halliday, he said, you know, let's play Game of Tunes. I was like, hmm. It's like Game of Thrones was. Essentially, we did this for about two, three hours. He put on his iPad, his speaker, and he'd play a tune. He, you know, you just go on Apple Music, you pick a tune. And we just kept passing it around. Everybody picked a tune. You know, it's not like you, you're going to determine, you know, you got to submit the tune a month in advance. No, so I pass the iPad, I play something. And we all just learned so much. And it wasn't about, you know, an educational moment, but it was educational. Because in doing that, everyone got exposed to some music they hadn't heard before. And not only that, you got a chance to get a little bit more personal insight into that person. You know, sometimes you'll see someone and you say, okay, yeah, I know what you like. You're a jazz guy, so you don't really. And then you put on Frank McComb, and they're like, what do you know about that? You know, I put on P.J. Moore, and they're like, what? You know, it's just me. It goes back to, you know, she said, it's just music. But, but also, for musicians, you know, I think, and I don't know if this is a generational thing. I don't want to sound like I'm wagging a finger, but, you know, it, it develops. It takes time to be able to develop and, 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 and patience. And, and I always say that the way we hear music greatly influences how we play. I love asking this question. The, think of the last time you listened to a record start to finish with no interruptions. And you weren't doing anything else. You didn't you know, stop to pet your giraffe, you didn't get up and go to the bathroom, just you and that record. And because a lot of, I started asking this question because a lot of young people I talked to never had that experience. They put on the second tune and they'll skip to the fifth one and they'll go to the third one and they'll skip to their favorite solo. And it impacts the way that you hear music because you've not developed an organic way of just hearing as it's presented to you. So then what happens when we play? You play a ballad. By the second chorus, it's double time. By the third course, nobody even knew it started off as a ballad. Because you wanted to get to the fun part, right? But just allowing it to happen. Play a tune in two and never go to four, unless the music says go to four. As opposed to, no, I'm bored, so let me play in four, you know? But again, if you've not heard recordings of that happening, sometimes you don't understand how valuable that can be. But it takes time and it takes patience. Just sit and listen. You're not texting, you're not watching Netflix, no, you're just, you're just listening to the record. And it's really amazing the experience that you get from that. Well, let's thank our panelists. This has been awesome. <laughs> the next thing tonight, don't miss the concert, 7.30 p.m. here. Um, it's free, but you do have to get a ticket. So if you haven't got a ticket yet, make sure you get one from the box office. And we'll see you at the concert tonight. Thanks for coming. <laughs>